Because when we get in line to go board the plane, as soon as it comes to us, they're like, come this way. And we're like, okay. Mm -hmm. And so then they're like, are these your bags? And we're like, yeah, these are our bags. And they're like, did you pack them yourself? And we're like, yeah. The cop takes out, or like, I don't know, whatever police dude, takes out this fucking huge knife and he just cuts into the into the bag and like cokes are pouring out. You are now watching The Chris LaBelle Show. All right, welcome for whom LaBelle tolls. This is our seventh episode, seven. We've done seven episodes in seven weeks. We've had some incredible guests with some incredible topics and uh, we've had some great numbers. So I'd like to thank all of you that have stayed tuned and every Thursday, 8 p.m., you guys keep rolling through and the numbers are looking fantastic. So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but this show has been financed by an investor and we've done quite well with this and our investor is very happy. But July 15th, we go to the second round of investment. So we have to hit a certain number and our analytics have to show that we're thriving. And then the podcast proceeds. And in fact, we got some other things coming up again uh, in July 15th. We've got some new products coming out as well as a possible cooking show. Yeah. And then I'm back on stage as a comedian. And of course, I'm going to be doing my cannabis infused dinners. And I'm probably going to do a psilocybin infused dinner as well. In fact, I love mushrooms. I've been using mushrooms consistently for the past 32 years of my life. I know I'm that old, but I've been meddling around for a long time. I call it medicine. It's done an incredible job for my well-being, my cognitive, my synapses. It's never been so sharp. I'm just so impressed with mushrooms. I love mushrooms. I love mushrooms! <laughs> and I don't care because uh, eventually they're gonna become legal. And when they do, I'm gonna be a big part of that. I feel like I'm the old wizard of this shit. And if people have questions and wanna know about mushrooms, hit me up. I'm gonna have a mushroom based episode. It's gonna be completely based on psilocybin. I'm probably gonna eat about two to four grams, maybe 10 grams. I don't know how I'm gonna be that day, but we're gonna be zooming pretty good. And quite frankly, you know, I've been taking medication, so I'm focused, right? I, I don't need medication. I prefer to use mushrooms or cannabis, but I got to use my Adderall medication. I mean, ADHD medication, which is Adderall, which keeps me highly precipitated on the, the show, the task at hand, because otherwise I'd be going all over the place and LK Visuals is an angry fucking Hungarian that doesn't eat a lot because he fasts, because he likes to stay fucking lean, because that's his style. He likes to be lean, right? Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know what I mean? That's a, he's like, uh, my friend is in this prison. I had this uh, he's not here anymore. Tell me what happened to him. So Jean-Claude always in the movies, he's always like, I need to know. I have answers. I need answers to find out. He's always very intense. I like Jean-Claude Van Damme. I, I, I liked how transparent he was later in life, how we talked about his cocaine addiction. And speaking of drugs and cocaine and prisons and all sorts of stuff, we have an amazing special guest here for you today. Um, our guest today is internationally recognized as a drug smuggler. Uh, she spent four and a half years in a Panama prison, known globally, internationally. She's Calgary born. She was actually on National Geographic, had her own episode on a show about being imprisoned in another country. And four and a half years in a Panama prison and um, to come back into Canada and do some time in a federal prison as well. I mean, this woman is, uh, has seen things and she's got incredible stories and she's overcome a ton of adversity and now she's back on the track and uh, she's living the right life. And uh, she's here in our studio today. So Christina Jocko is gonna be here today and that's our special guest. Okay, so we are, we are in the studio. We're at Alavanca Jiu-Jitsu on 16th Ave Northeast where we always hold our episodes. Beautiful gym. In the studio with us today, we have the honor, the pleasure to be with Christina Jocko. Christina spent four and a half years in a Panama prison for drug smuggling. She's Calgary born, she's Canadian, and she's got a hell of a story. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you coming. No problem. Nice. So, uh, how do we start? How do we how do we get to that? How do we get to become an international drug trafficker? Like, how did how did that even start? I don't even like. Like, do you want me to go back to like trauma, childhood, and? Well, I'm not Dr. Phil. You know? <laughs> I'm not Dr. Phil. Like, I don't know what I could do for you, like about past trauma <laughs> as a child. But we could start off as uh, we could start. I'm just gonna fix your mic here to touch. There we go. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about like you know, you're how old are you? Like, you how long are you in Calgary? Where what neighborhood are you from? Little things like that. I'm from the hood. The hood. What up? Uh, born and raised out in the southeast area. Uh, I had a young mom, and oh, yeah. uh, she had me when she was 15. Wow. So that's young. Yeah, I mean, I, I when I think about how I got there, I think about my upbringing. So I didn't have the best upbringing. I went to five different elementary schools. 
Um, yeah. You're starting to sound like Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> so, not, said, so not the best upbringing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We do what we could. He turned out good, though. Yeah, he turned out good. All right. Um, so how old are you now? I am 32. I'm turning 33 next month. Yeah, you're looking good. Looking good. Good thing I'm Asian, though. Asian, yeah. no raisin. Asian? Asian, no raisin. I'm sorry. I keep looking at your dick. <laughs> Is it there? It's, oh, it's, yeah. It's I, I, I didn't. I don't know. That's awkward. We're gonna keep this though. I, I, I don't know how much I gotta pay her for after saying that, but uh, I could try to hear. But if I'm in, what do they call it? Man, here. I'll, oh my god, that's uncomfortable. But I'll cross my leg. How's that? I, at some point, I'm gonna have to move my leg again. Well, uh, it's making it worse. Yeah, it's making it worse. <laughs> it's more higher. Up. Oh put my it, god. Put it. Put it back. Okay. Here we go. We'll just go back into. There we are. Okay, so right. um, sorry. Sorry. okay, so you're you're born in Calgary, yeah, and you said that you're you're part Asian. Well, who's Asian? Uh, uh, so my father is uh, Vietnamese, and my mother is uh, First Nations, and a pinch of uh, white in there. Pinch of white, right? A little bit of white privilege. Awesome. Nice. Um, and she's from Alberta. She is from Picton, Ontario. Oh. Ontario. Picton. Is she, is she Ojibwe? What is she? Do you know? We are Algonquin. 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 Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Algonquin. Mm -hmm. And then your dad is? Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And he was from Calgary. No. No. He's from the boat. The boat. He's a fob. Well, where'd they meet? He came to Canada when he was about 13 years old and they met at A.E. Cross. Mm. And uh, they started dating, yeah pretty quickly there and uh, I remember her telling me they used to go to Rollerland. Rollerland. I, I'm not from here. So I'm, okay, I'm, so Rollerland's in the hood. Where's the hood? Okay, Forest Lawn. Yeah. We the lawn! Yeah. <laughs> so Calgary has hood? Would you say Forest Lawn was hood? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not like other hoods. Other hoods are definitely hoodier than our hoods, yeah. but it's the hood of Calgary. Okay. I mean, there's other hoods, I guess. No, I, I, my first place I lived in was in, was in Albert Park, so I mean, I... Well, there you go. I, I went to Albert Park Elementary. There you one go. Of. Yeah. So I'm hood, too. You, you get it. I'm a little hood. You know what's up. I know what's up. <laughs> so you uh, you grew up in Forest Lawn, mm -hmm. First Nation mom, Vietnamese yeah. dad. Yeah. They mom had you at 15 years old. Yeah. And so they, how old was dad? Dad was 18. Oh, dad. Got the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Picking up them youngins. That's all right. Brothers and sisters. Uh, I got one full blood sister, mm -hmm. and then I have a couple half sisters out there floating mm -hmm. around. Floating around, <laughs> <laughs> just, just collecting dust. Just <laughs> yeah, we'll get in touch with them once in a blue moon. Here, uh, got some got some family floating around. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um. Yeah, but they split up shortly after uh, my sister was born. Yeah. And so then I was going back and forth between my grandmothers and my mom's, That's and so there and was. What did you? Where did you find more stability? Grandmas, moms? Uh, probably my grandmas. She yeah. was a lot more, obviously, like older, more mature. They both had jobs, my grandpa as well. And I had an aunt and uncle that were only a few years older than me. So they were kind of like brothers and sisters too. Um, but not having that stability, I guess, growing up or like the proper nurturing, I guess you could say too, mm. is probably why I was acting out so much as a child. I was bad from day one. Yeah. Fighting, doing drugs, drinking. When did the drugs start? I was 12. 12. I was drinking and smoking weed. And then when I was about 16, I started doing ecstasy. Mm. Yes. I still love that was like that was you my, still what that was the, <laughs> that was a monumental drug for me. Yeah. Like if if I could suggest anybody trying a drug, it would probably be MDMA. <laughs> Started the show off with mushroom talk. Now we're talking about MDMA. <laughs> Mushrooms are great too. <laughs> Mushrooms are great. So so you you so you you came up. There wasn't much stability, like a traditional yeah. family. We stability. were poor, poor, broken home. Uh, changing schools, midnight moves, no food in the house kind of thing, going to the food bank, that kind of stuff. And then also, I guess, with my with my race as well, like there, I didn't have a sense of belonging, I guess, because I wasn't Asian enough to hang oh, with the Asians. Oh, yeah. I wasn't Native enough to hang with the Natives, and I wasn't white. I had a pinch, but, you know. I actually know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's half fucked Italian, up. Half Italian, right? Mm -hmm. half, half Caucasian, right? Yeah. French Italian. Yeah. Wasn't Italian enough to be with the Italians. Was too Italian to be with the Canadians. So I had to hang out with all the mixed race kids. Yes. That's, and you know what I mean? And, and then, that's the hood. That's the hood. <laughs> Yeah, I, honestly, like I'm from Thunder Bay, like we're, I'm from the rough part of Thunder Bay, like yeah. a lot of mixed, a lot of mixed culture mm -hmm. in my neighborhood as well. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I too started meddling with drugs and alcohol, 12, mm -hmm. 13 years old, got yeah. into trouble, a lot of fighting. Uh, Thunder Bay people, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll disclaimer, I lost most of those fights, but it made me <laughs> tough as fuck. I won almost all of my fights. Damn. Yeah. We're in a jiu-jitsu studio right uh, now, too. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll, have to get you, we'll have to get you on the bag after. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so we, um, so there was instabilities coming yes. up as a child. Yeah. Coming up through teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, you guys were, were struggling. You guys were going to food banks. You mm -hmm. didn't have some consistency, so there wasn't consistent income. Yeah. You didn't have a sense of belonging culturally, right? You couldn't right. identify with anybody, so you're kind of a floating around, like yep. your, your half-sisters you were telling me about. Yeah. Well, a lot I of floaters, a lot of floaters in this family. Okay, I can't say that about all of them. One of them is like, we were raised together, but. Who's that? Ashley. Ashley. She's a sweetheart. She's oh. different though. She's different from me and my other sister because mm. she didn't grow up like that. And when I look at her, she's mm. like a compassionate, loving, like just the sweetest girl. And me and my sister were just like, I guess we're kind of rough. Yeah. I've learned to be a little bit softer, but you know, we're a little bit, we're a little bit ghetto. Yeah. When I first, <laughs> when I first, when I first met you, 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 you had just come out, you had just finished serving your time. Right. And we had a hangout mm -hmm. and you were a little more aggressive then. Than you are now. Like today, I was like today, I was like, wow, you've. You, I was actually, wow, you've calmed down a touch. Maybe I'm getting older. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Would you say the life experiences that you've had over the last four to six years have chilled you out? One hundred percent. That was probably the biggest wake up call. Like I, I haven't really even been in a fight since those things have happened because mm. I, those things made me realize like that fighting ultimately could lead to death. Like fighting is serious. It is. So, and I, I didn't take it like that. It was like a, I guess a shield for me, a protection to fight. So if I was louder and I was faster and I was stronger and I would hit you before you'd hit me kind of thing, it warded off people, right? It yeah. kept, it protected me, but. Uh, did you build a reputation? Yes, I did. <laughs> When I went, when I actually, so after I started experimenting with ecstasy, mm. I wanted to lose that. Like I had like an awakening when I tried ecstasy. Like it was like my heart, my icicle heart melted and I didn't want to be this mean, angry person anymore. Mm. And uh, that it opened that doorway for me and I tried to shed like that name and it followed me. Like people who wouldn't know me, they would like warn people about me. They'd be like, oh, that girl's fucking crazy. Like, don't even look at her wrong. Or what, would be, what would be considered crazy? Like if you look back and you were to think of a crazy moment or moments, <laughs> like what would be something that you can reflect on and looking back these years and saying, shit, that was, that was kind of crazy. That might've put me here. I mean, Panama was kind of crazy, but before that, I mean, just with fighting wise, like I would, somebody could look at me wrong you know, mm. or call me a bitch. Oh, I, and I wanted it. I couldn't wait, couldn't wait for somebody to just tick me off or do something disrespectful in any way. Mm. And I would just go ape, like I would fuck them up. I know I'm little, but, and that's what a part of the problem was, but little man syndrome. <sighs> hey, let me tell you all about little man syndrome. I've been living little man syndrome for four decades. Yeah. So it's actually funny that the more you describe your upbringing, I can relate. Yeah. The more you can describe the trouble that you got into, I relate. Mm -hmm. I too was a fire firecracker mm -hmm. and waiting for someone just to offend me. Mm -hmm. Well, then, unlike yourself, I would just be like, hey guys, this guy's fucking with me over here. <laughs> and then like the homies would go in and then I would be like, yeah. yeah like and that. then then eventually like there was, there was times the guy went through my homies and he's like, your turn. Cause I'm from Thunder Bay and people are tough as fuck where I'm from. Oh my goodness. They're so tough yeah. with Thunder Bay. Um, so yeah, so things were tough. I get that. Yep. And uh, so I was asking you though, like aside from fighting, mm -hmm. if you can look back, what was a, a positive memory from those times? Like, what could you say? Yeah, that was, that was a nice moment. You know, I, I keep thinking about fighting. I don't know why, you're, you're, but well, I, we're in a, I mean, look at our atmosphere. Right I, now. I guess that's probably what it is, but I kind of became like a vigilante oh, a little bit, you yeah. know, like I would stick up like, so I had a friend, Anna, and she was a bit bigger. And it, this girl, one of our... Was she thick? She was... Like thick. She was thick. Did she have the two, two, two Cs? <laughs> three Cs? How many Cs? Thick. Like how, how thick was Anna? Okay, let's not... It's not about Anna. It's not about Anna. It's not about <laughs> We're Anna. not going to go there. Anna. I don't, I don't want to embarrass her if she watches. 
<laughs> well, I mean, thick is in. It's like it's true. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. But a girl called her a fat bitch, and I went and fucked her up for her. Oh wow. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, I ripped her around by her backpack. I was swinging her around, and I threw her in the snow, and I started bashing her face in the snow, and I oh. gave her a bloody nose. So you had those tendencies. I did. I, I, well, I, tro- I didn't want to be so mean for no reason. So I'm like, I'm just going to be like good. But I couldn't stop the fighting though. Mm. It was like I was addicted to it. It gave me power, control. Where did it lead you to? Oh, goodness. I mean, it led me to a place of like, as you get older, you start to realize that you don't want people to dislike you. And like, mm. I thought fear, I liked when people feared me. Mm. But then, as I got older, I'm like, I don't want people to fear me. Like, I want people to like me, and I want to like people. Mm. And it was really hard to shed that. So I had a a lot of self-esteem issues, I guess, and I Mm. didn't know how to change. And so maybe that's why I also turned to drugs a lot, and especially with the ecstasy, because it made me so, like, loving and, like, open. Your serotonin was just flowing. Yeah, Mm. I was like a flower just blossoming. And then you just got angry at yourself. You're like, fuck this flower. <laughs> just waiting for it to decay and wilt. Yeah. So anyways, um, so I guess, it, I guess being like that too, attracted not the best crowds. Hmm. So hanging out with people who also were like-minded and also getting into worse trouble than what I was getting into. So what kind of people were they? I guess you could say people who were probably similar to me, just looking for control, a sense of power, but, you know, like just trying to to gain something, like something, whatever, money. How old were you when this was happening, when the outside influences started to align with you? You started to bring in that kind of energy, those kind of people. How old would you say you were then? I would say between the ages of 15 and probably like 19. Mm. So, and I had like a mixed bunch of people, right? So you have like your work people, you have like your kind of gang people or Mm. drug dealing people and party people and yeah. But you start to gravitate to one side more than the other. And yeah, I, I started gravitating towards drugs and dealing and stealing and stealing just, well like robbing people damn <laughs> that's a robbery yeah i've done some bad things in my life and i i i feel bad about them i really do i sometimes i think about like one person i'm not gonna say his name but yeah he got set up pretty bad and we profited off of it and it's just it's really unfortunate that that's that's what that world is yeah and so I'm glad to be out of it now, but it, it definitely took me a long journey to get to this point. You had mentioned like working class, party people, mm-hmm. and you were like gang people. Mm-hmm. Were you in a gang? I was not in a gang, mm. but I know a lot of people in gangs. They're friends, mm. but I, I wouldn't say that I'm like an affiliate in any way. Yeah, so those days are done. Yeah, no. But during those days, would you say you were affiliated with the homies? I've never been a gangster. So you've only done your own thing? I've only been doing my own thing. Oh, shit. Honestly. Doesn't that make you gang? <laughs> don't that make you gangster? You're like, I don't need a gang. I'm a one-man <laughs> gang. I do my own thing. That makes you a G. That means that you're your own, you're your own identity, your own entity. You're an entrepreneur. Yeah. I've been told that. Hustle. Transferable skills. Tra- <laughs> <laughs> Transferable skills. Yeah. So you're 19 years old. You're mm-hmm. running with the wrong crowd. Mm-hmm. You're getting yourself into trouble. Yeah. You're, you're dealing drugs. Mm-hmm. You're thieving. Doing drugs. Doing drugs. And so not, what kind of drugs were you doing at oh 19? Oh, my God. I don't even, like, it's embarrassing. It started out with cocaine and, like, partying. And then I basically was like, wow, like, I, I, I'm such a party person. Like, I, I gra- like, I, uh, I don't You bring know. the party. I bring the fucking party. I get it. <laughs> no, but, um... I, I had the idea to like start a phone. I was like, I could start a phone just off of by going to parties and like out of all the friends, cause I was surrounded by other cokeheads basically. Sorry, I don't want to call people cokeheads, but we were cokeheads. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. What defines a cokehead? <clears throat> somebody who's like, can't, well a cokehead, I would say somebody who can't stop doing coke. So it's like, oh, I'm just gonna get a bag. And then you're like, 
can I get another one? At like, you know, you're waiting for the liquor store to open at fucking 10 a.m. You're on a all Sunday? just on a, on sketching a, out. On waiting. a Sunday? <laughs> yeah. Sunday morning? <laughs> Just a bunch of gargoyles. The sun's coming through a little basement window fucking yeah. apartment. And you're like, no, the birds are chirping. Oh, the that's the way. Yeah, up. the birds. Yeah, that's, that's how you know. That's that's Satan. Yeah, He's like, it's awful. Yeah, that's not God. Ugh, disgusting. I hate those days so much. But Was there a lot of cocaine? There was mountains of cocaine. Wow. Yeah. Was that in the Forest Lawn area or was that now downtown? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was a little bit everywhere. Really? Yeah. Wherever the party was, you were. Wherever the party fucking was, I was there. Wow. <laughs> so you were partying hard those days. I was partying hard. Like, I was going, I wouldn't sleep and I'd go to work and then I was like, I'm going to sleep tonight. And then I'd get off work and I'd be like, okay, one more night. Oh, shit. Yeah. Now, when did you know it was becoming a problem? Um, when I couldn't go to work. What or... were you doing those days? What kind of work? I, I've always been serving. Oh. So I started out at a Calgary Petroleum Club. Oh. Fine dining. When we had that money. Oh, yeah. Mm. I was killing it. Oil I, money. I was too young for that money, though. <laughs> 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 oh, goodness. But uh, I went from there to the casinos. And then this is when Cash Casino was, there was only like three casinos. It was Cash. Mm. It was called Frank's back then. Yeah, it was. Frank's Sistens and Deerfoot. Frank's Sistens. Yeah. Oh, and Elbow. Elbow was Elbow. there too. But I was in the. Po I was a poker waitress. Really? Yeah. What year was that? This was. Was I here yet? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. That was my heyday of poker. Yeah. Where were you working? Uh, cash Casino. I, 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 I was more of a stampede at the time. Stampede. Stampede Cas wasn't open yet. Oh, it wasn't even open this yet. Is, so this is what I'm talking about. Stampede wasn't open. It no, was, Cowboys wasn't open yet, but Stampede Casino was going. Me. Because I was doing comedy shows there in their were big you? sky showroom. Yeah, I was already selling out comedy shows. At oh, the beginning okay. of my career. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just in case anybody ever wondered. I, yeah, there's the comics out there. Oh, you're a comedian. Did an open mic night. <laughs> yeah, I filmed <thought, laughs> casinos. Anyways, don't be a hater. Um, so back in those days, so you're working, <laughs> you're working in, a, in a poker room? Yeah. Oh, maybe Stampede didn't have a poker room. Or did they, they have, did a, poker have a poker room? room. Yeah, maybe it a, was crap. When you come, in, when you come in that room, when you come in that side door, and then it's on the right-hand side. Was it's this always, before they renovated it? Like, was this, like, was it new? No, they everything's still pretty much the same. Just Cowboys took over the Big Sky showroom and became Cowboys. Are you sure? Trust me, I'm a Penny Lane guy. Okay, either way. Okay. Either way, you're a cash. <laughs> I'm a cash. And the action's at cash anyways. And the action's at fucking I know, cash. And I know that. Like, it was like, I couldn't even fucking keep up. I was making 500 bucks a day cash, plus my hourly wage. Damn. At 19. Wow. That's a lot of dough. It was too much. I literally would hide money in my sweater pockets, and mm. I would put on a sweater, and I'd be like, whoa. Damn. What a cash. Mm. I was actually making more there than I was drug dealing. <laughs> Wow. Because <laughs> I wasn't doing drugs heavily yet. Mm. So. And when did the heavy drug use start? Probably right around. Uh, actually, I so I started gambling. Oh, I've been there. Mm. Them slot machines. Slot machines? You started with the penny slots? <laughs> no. <laughs> no started... The dollar slots? Ooh, loonies. Five bucks a spin slots? Yeah, for those of you that are outside of Canada, we have a loony. I'm sure you've heard of it. And uh, so you just, did you have just a fucking cup of loonies? Just, <laughs> right? Just fucking, fring, ching, fring, ching, fring, -na 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 -na. Was that you? No, maybe. Wait, no, in those days, it was the electronics, it was just a button, yeah. right? Just, <laughs> Actually, yes, it is the vouchers. But they still had, at Frank's, maybe they still had that? They had the bowling alley at Frank's. Yes, they that was, did. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. You yeah. like to bowl? I, I love bowling, we'll actually. go bowling. Okay. Let's go bowl. Do appreciate it. you being on the show. Kick your I appreciate ass you. Bowling. We can kick my ass. <laughs> we can kick my ass. I'll kick your ass bowling. Just bowling. Just bowling. Yeah, I don't want to be bullied. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm not a bully anymore. Yeah, yeah just keep it bowling. <laughs> no gambling, no drugs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but no, I do. I do appreciate being open and authentic and sharing. Um, I know you got a pretty crazy story. So let's, uh, now that you've warmed up a little bit, <laughs> yeah. you're at the casino. You start partying, you're making 500 bucks a day. Yep. When did that transition into becoming a drug smuggler? Okay, so it starts with addiction is really where it starts. So the, the gambling started, it got so out of hand, and then I was like, I need to stop gambling. Mm -hmm. So I just quit gambling, you know? It was hard. I didn't obviously quit the first try, but mm -hmm. um, when you tend to quit one addiction, you will go to another. So then I started drinking again, and then with drinking comes cocaine. 
And then I was introduced to opiates. Oh no. I didn't know that it was an opiate though. I was just, I just knew it was a pill. So I was, was fucked up one night and I couldn't sleep and uh, I was dating a, I'm not gonna say his name. Of an course, ex. yeah. <laughs> and um, he had fallen asleep and then his roommate woke up in the morning and he saw me and he was like, do you want an oxy? He's like, you look fucking terrible. And I was like, I feel terrible. I'm like, what's an oxy? He's like, don't worry. He's like, it'll straighten you right out. You'll be like, it'll be like, you didn't even do blow. And I was like, shut up and take my fucking money. <laughs> like right now. And so he comes back and he brings back a, a like a 40 milligram oxy and he's peeling off the little, the, the coat around it. He crushes it up and he, and so then my ex comes out and he gives me like the tiny, like literally like just a, a pinch and I did it and it was just like, <sighs> like instant, like no like tensing, no like, like I felt like new again. And I was like, wow, what is this? Mm. And so I did, I had no idea what an opiate was. Like I knew what heroin was and I was like, oh, I'll never do heroin. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah. Gross. You yeah. know, that's beneath me. I agree. Yeah. And here I am just doing it in a pill form. Snorting. Snorting. Just An because opiate. I'm, just cause I'm doing it through my nose. It's better. Mm. <laughs> so <clears throat> that became like. So with the drink, so I would drink on the weekends and then I would do the Coke and then the next thing would be the Oxys. Mm. And then eventually I was like, I don't even want to do Coke anymore, I just want an Oxy. And so I would just do, and it, you know, and it was just like here and there for a little while as it, that's how addiction is. Yeah. Um, and before you knew it, I was doing it like three days in a row and then I would like sleep for like two days and then get up and do it again. Mm. And I remember the turning point too, where it was like, if I keep doing this, I know that I'm gonna be doing it like every day or that I'm gonna need to do it every day. Hmm. And you know what I said? Fuck, Fuck it. it. Yep. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll, it's like, I can handle it. Like I had no idea what I was getting into. I was like, you know, I watched, so that same roommate that introduced me to that stuff, he went through withdrawal like maybe a few weeks before I came to that crossroad. Mm. And when I watched him struggling, like I just didn't believe him. Like I thought he was just like milking it, you know? I was like, oh, whatever. Like you just feel like shit, like calm down. Yeah. I didn't say that to him, but like that's what I was thinking. How's your mood? What do you mean? Calm down, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you feel that maybe that was your own fears? You're not wanting them to be coming through withdrawal? Like, maybe you're like, oh, shit, this is... This is I, I guess I just never understood it. Like, I mm. didn't... I, when you don't know, you're like, what is that? Like, what's happening to you? And yeah. you're just like, oh, I feel like shit. Like, and, you know, snotting and, like, in a blanket. So that's so. a real deal. It, it's real. Even it's, from, like, just from oxys. Not uh, fentanyl. Like, even the oxys cause Oxys? That. Okay, I've been addicted to fentanyl, too. And, like, oxys was probably the worst thing that I've ever gotten off of. Mm. Like, it feels like your skin is crawling, your fucking bones are cracking and trying to like escape your body. You can't shit, you can't piss, you can't sleep, you can't eat. And then when you finally do get to a point where you can fall asleep, your fucking legs and arms, you get like restless leg syndrome. So it's like you're about to fall asleep and all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> like out of nowhere. Wow. And it wakes you up and then you gotta try and go through that process of trying to sleep again. It is fucking awful. It is awful. At first it feels like this warm blanket, but you don't realize it, that it's like encasing you and like slowly the lights disappearing, but you're too distracted by the warmth before you realize that there's no light. <laughs> like... So you battled fentanyl addiction, mm -hmm. oxys, mm -hmm. cocaine, yeah. drinking, yeah. gambling, mm -hmm. just a young thing, all these, all these dilemmas. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, I think it was just that I was coming to the realization that like what I was doing or how I was living my life wasn't what I wanted it to be. And I just had no idea how to get there. And, you know, I was brought up not to, I guess, cry or whine or ask for things. And so when I was struggling, and I didn't even know that I was struggling, you know? Mm. Like, you're, you're so desensitized. To, like, I didn't even, I couldn't even identify an emotion back then. Like, I, I only knew happy and angry. 
that was it. There was no in between. And so struggling with all that stuff, it was so hard for me to reach out. Like I didn't know how. And I, it, I also felt like a failure asking for help. Yeah. And so God willing me be a failure, fuck no. Like, you know, I didn't know then that asking for help is actually more strength than than not asking. Than not asking. Than trying to pretend that it's not there or just doing it on your own. I'm I'm notorious for that. I can do it by myself. I got this. What month are you born? August. August. I'm a Leo. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Man, that's crazy. Yeah. I haven't had anybody on the show yet that's we've never talked about addiction. We haven't Uh, talked about drugs. We haven't talked about criminality. (sighs) You're the first. Wow. And I wanted to bring you on for that. I want I knew that you would give an honest perspective. Yeah. I knew that you I mean, we've spoken in the past. We, I mean, shit, I found you online. I found you on Facebook. And it was your sister, who I've only met once or twice, mm-hmm. that had posted a repost from you yeah. about your situation. Mm-hmm. And I look at the post, and I'm like, yo, what a beautiful girl. You're a beautiful girl. And I'm like, what a beautiful girl. And... She's hilarious. You cracked me up. I started watching like your posts and your videos and she used to make these like crazy funny videos in this Panama prison. I was and, bored. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to be like, how do you have a cell phone to make these videos? But my vagina. Okay. Yeah, no, you're not you're kidding, but not kidding. Uh, not mine. Someone not- else's. <laughs> So when we had met, I had met you online yeah. and I started reaching out to you yep. and I was literally genuine and being authentic. Like, what can I do? Mm-hmm. How can I be supportive? Mm-hmm. Cause I just found that like, you don't look like someone that should be in like a third world prison. Yeah. And I was like, and I watched you and I, and I was with you as much as I could be. And I always was there to like reach out and send a message and I couldn't wait till you got out and you got out, of course, and mm-hmm. you know, we were able to connect and yeah. finally meet. You were one of the first people that I actually hung out with when I got out. No way. Yeah. Mm. We hung out like three weeks after I got out, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. I couldn't wait. <laughs> you were like, I, I remember like you were still like, like you were just <laughs> wild. Like you just had so much energy. Ah. And I was just like, okay. Yeah. I, I was mean, like, yeah. Prison will do that to you. <laughs> Tell us about that. Oh, where do I even start, man? Well, you had you had finished stating that you were battling with fentanyl and oxys and drinking and all that jazz. And okay. how do we go from addiction, and again, to becoming a drug smuggler, an internationally known criminal that made the news, that was on National Geographic, had her own story <laughs> on National Geographic, like something that most of us all watch. Yeah. I love National Geographic. Me too. So... Let's get to it. How did we get from Calgary to Panama? Okay, so the drug addiction obviously got way out of control. Mm. And I was dealing at the time. So my drug addiction was so bad that I couldn't hold a real job. I couldn't show up for my shifts on time. Couldn't, like, I would be dope sick sometimes at work. And so it just wasn't working. So I went, I was dealing part time and, like, just on the weekends at the parties, like I was saying. And so then I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna do this full time. So I started doing this full time. And when you start doing things full time and, like, I'm, I have really good work ethic. <laughs> you do, you helped set up today. So I, I network like a motherfucker, mm. you know what I mean? So you meet people and you're like, hey, like, you know, you're trying to get like best deals, trying to like, you're just trying to build your little empire. And so that's what I was trying to do. But my addiction got so out of hand that I would do, first it started, I would do my own, prof, all my profit. And then eventually got to the point where I would do my own shit and then I'd be cuffing stuff and I'd end up doing that. And before you know it, you're in a fucking hole, like a huge hole. So you're trying to make like crazy moves and you know, an opportunity came. And I was at, like, I was suicidal. I didn't know it then, but like, I was suicidal. Like, I remember I used to sit in my bedroom window and I would contemplate just falling out. And I knew, I was like, something needs to change. I'm like, uh, like, something neat like I was calling for it you know because I I hated myself I hated my life I didn't like what I was doing it wasn't working I was a bad fucking drug dealer I was the (laughs) worst like I talk (laughs) I've said that on stage about myself a few times like just wasn't meant for me wasn't meant for you for little people yeah you should have just been making people laugh and being kind (laughs) right just melt our icy hearts into nice. If I could just give the drugs away for free, yeah, that would yeah. be awesome. <laughs> the whole, the whole uh, monopoly of it all, the whole administration yeah. side of things. Yeah. 
So anyways, um, when this opportunity came to me, so I was getting my stuff off of this other guy and he was like, hey, I met these Colombians. And Ooh. okay, so originally he wanted to jack them. Okay, and I've made a jack move with this guy before. I'm not, I, I feel bad, I hate talking about him, but I'm gonna go into it because it's the truth. But this was the actual intention. So I wasn't actually supposed to even go to Panama. But they were like, can they basically, he introduced me to the Colombians and they were like, can you please find us people to go to Panama and bring this back? I'm like, okay, what's the pay? They're like 10 grand. And I was like, would you be able to like reinvest in some product then instead of giving me 10 grand kind of thing, right? And they're like, oh yeah, for sure. So I was like, oh, Scarface, Scarface, Scarface. Change also. This was that change that I saw coming or that I needed, that I was calling for. I was like, this is it. This is this turning point. I'm gonna get out of this yeah. fucking hole. Like, I'm gonna change the game. I really honestly believe that with my, with my whole heart. And you know, it did, but just not in the way that I thought. But anyway, so when they said that, I was like, I'll do it. I'm gonna fucking do it. Like, let me go. Mm. Let, me, let me do this, please. Like, I was like, I wanted to. They didn't even really want me to. They wanted me to help them move product. But I was like, no, I want to go. I want this money. I want this product. Like, you know? So um, I end up going. I ended up going with um, another guy named Jason, and he's actually passed away. He actually did a run after I'd gone to jail in Peru, and instead of doing the suitcase thing, he swallowed capsules, and they actually burst inside his stomach when he was at the airport, and he died in Peru. And it was, I remember talking to his wife because we kept in contact after I went to jail, and like it was hell bringing his body back. Like it's really hard to bring back a deceased body or even ashes actually on an yeah. airplane. But anyways, sorry. No, no, that's <laughs> just because my face looks sad doesn't mean it's sad. My condolences. Yeah. But you don't have to at any point be like, okay, moving forward. Like I know. we're okay. here. We're good. Express yourself. Like okay. just let's get it out. Yeah. So well, anyway, so Jason is the one. He I did my first run with him. And we went, like, it was every, it was glamorous, you know? Like, we got picked up by, like, people, like, holding signs waiting for us. Um, they take us, and we go partying in the city. And then they drive us to the resort. And they give us, like, a whole bunch of cash to spend while we're there. Ooh. And, um, oh, I, I snuck oxys with me, actually, because I was still on opiates at this time. Oh, yes. I put them in a tampon applicator and then shoved it in my hoo-ha. The hoo-ha. The hoo-ha. The hoo-ha. And I made it to Panama with my oxys. Mm. And then we get there, and our, it's our, our second day there, and we go to, like, the spa or something, and I don't know how, but I ended up taking out my oxys, and I fucking lost them while I was there. Mm. <laughs> I was dope sick that whole entire trip. It was fucking awful. Mm. And uh, I honestly think it might have even helped us get through when we came back from Panama. So anyways, I'm not going to go through the details of how we got all this stuff. I'm just wondering where that tampon is. <laughs> just sitting there still somewhere on the side of a beach just in Panama. No, just like I oxys. took it out. Yeah. Okay, the, the tampon is gone. I had just like my little baggie of shit and I must have taken it like out of my bag or something to like look for ID or something mm. and I lost my stash. Mm. It was, it was fucking awful. And I, I, like Jason was such a good, like I honestly, like I've never had somebody be so compassionate to somebody being like dope sick. You know, he was massaging my feet, he was running the shower for me, and he was just like, you're so strong, like, you're getting, like, he was encouraging me, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, but, um, anyway, so, at the end of our trip, we get our bags, we're almost late for our plane, okay, you're supposed to get there two hours early, we're almost late for mm. the plane, and I also think that might have been why we got through so easy, uh, easily as well, um, but yeah, so we we go back to Canada. We have 16 keys with us. 16 keys. 16 fucking keys. That's, for those of you at home right now that don't know too much about the uh, the drug game, 16 keys is a lot of cocaine. 
That's a yeah, lot. It's, That's it's, a lot. It's stupid. How much would that street value be today in 2021? In 2021, how much is 16 I don't even, Okay, why are you asking me this question? You think I'm in the game or something? Um, if your assume? parole officer is watching, <laughs> this is just an interested interviewer that's just curious to know. But I already have an idea. I know a key probably sells for 80 grand Canadian <laughs> yeah. these days. So like, do the math. That's... But that's if you're buying like a whole key. Like yeah. if you're selling off by the ounces, that's even more money. That's just an incredible amount of money. <laughs> that's nuts. So you guys got back 16 keys. Okay. What, what, when you land in Canada and you were in the taxi or you're driving home, like what kind of feeling is going on? Like you did it, you pulled it off. Oh, okay, so this is the fucked up part, okay? So the guy who introduced me to the Colombians, remember I told you, his, yeah. his plan was to rob the Colombians. Mm. So I knew he was gonna rob this guy after we gave him the shit. Oh gosh. I know, I, oh, awful. I was a horrible person. Mm. <sighs> Anyways, um, so he initially wanted us to be in on it, me and Jason. And when we went to Panama, so the Colombian, the, the boss sent his right hand man with us and I became friends with him. And I actually like, I just enjoyed him as a person and like I thought about it and I was like, I can't do this to them. Mm. Like, I'm not gonna do it. And I told Jason and he's like, yeah, I don't want to either. Like I had such a good time and he's like, I just, why don't we just keep working with him? I'm like, yeah, let's just keep working. Like why fuck up this, this business relationship? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> so you really evaluated things with Jason. I, we did, yeah. And so when we got back, so the right hand man was actually sent with us to make sure that we didn't jack them. Oh. So we land in Canada, we get pushed through and like inside, I'm like, yes like oh my god oh my god like so excited we get through right hand man is behind us he gets called off to the side to go get checked okay so our boss is supposed to be waiting for the, or the boss sorry not yeah anyways he's waiting outside waiting for us but we didn't know where he was and i knew that my boyfriend at the time was also waiting with the guy who connected us with the colombians mm. also in the car because we were all just going to go together and so, and that guy had like all his cousins and whatever waiting with like guns and shit to go like rob Whoa. him after we made the drop, right? But it, since that guy, the right hand man, got pulled off to the side, we were left alone with the stuff. Like we have the suitcases, they're in our name. Oh. And so we call and we're like, uh, like I called my, like the guy who connected us, sorry. Well, let's just call him John. <laughs> so we called John. And we're like, hey, where's the boss? We ha we're out, but like yeah. the guy's still back in there. And he was like, oh, just come to the truck. Just so casual, you know? Like he knew, he's masterminding this shit. <laughs> so we get in the truck and he's like, let's just fucking go. And I was like, what? And I was like, well, me and Jason don't wanna do this. Like, why can't we just like give him the stuff? Like, you know exactly where it's gonna be. Like, just go do your thing. We don't want any part of it. Like, you know, we just want our clean cut and like you do whatever you need to do. And he was like, oh my God, are you guys serious? He's like, we have the stuff, like, let's just go. And we're like, come on, like, don't do, like, we don't want to do this. And so he was like, okay, fine, I'll text him. We're so stupid. We're not like, he, we think he's texting. He's not fucking texting oh, him. Shit. Saying like, yeah, we're supposed to meet over here. We're supposed to meet over here. So we go to the 7-Eleven and butt fuck nowhere. I don't even know where the hell it was because we were like by the airport, right? <laughs> and um, by this time, we had gotten into John's car and my boyfriend left in the truck. And so we're at this 7-Eleven and we're waiting and we're like, well, where is he? And he's like, oh, you said he's gonna be here in a minute. He's probably just still, like his right-hand man's still getting checked or whatever. So we're like, okay, whatever. He's like, why don't you get out and stretch your legs? Or like, go, and I was like, yeah, I do have to pee. And I looked at Jason, I looked at him because I had a feeling and I was like, do not get out of the car. And he was like, okay, I go pee, come out of the bathroom. Who's in the fucking aisle? Jason. And as soon as I seen him, I ran outside and John was gone. No. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. With 16 keys With of cocaine. With 16 fucking keys that I could have helped rob. <laughs> you could have profited I, from that. I could have, but I was like, I had a change of heart, just trying to be a good guy all of a sudden. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yep. Good guys get stepped on in that, in that world. So Yo, that's crazy. I fucked up, man. I, I called him immediately after and I was like, please don't do this to me. I'm like, please, please. And he's like, 
He's like, just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm like, they know where I live. I'm like, what am I supposed to fucking do? Yeah. And then he stops answering my, he kept hanging up on me and he stops answering my phone calls. And then he sends me a text and he's like, shh, I'll share later. Like, okay. Yeah. So then I call an affiliate because <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I'm like, what do I do? I'm like, this just happened. I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, and this guy's dead now too, actually. Fuck. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Everybody's dead. <laughs> so anyways, uh, he tells me to get them to meet me in a public place and don't go anywhere with them. He's like, do not leave with them. He's like, the best thing you can do is just go to go to a restaurant, go to like a 7-Eleven something. So we go to the Humpties that's not there anymore, um, right by Marble Mall. Yeah, yeah. Be on the corner there. Yeah. We go, I, I was there first, we're waiting for them. Him and the right-hand man, the boss and the right-hand man come in and they look fucking pissed. Like they're so fucking mad and I'm crying because I'm like, I'm going to die. Like I knew, like I'm like, they're going to fucking kill me. Yeah. I just, how much, like I just lost them. Like, oh, it was intense. Like I, I honestly thought I was going to die that day. So anyways. Uh, it's we're not so, so anyways. It's, <laughs> uh, that's the real deal. Like you, you had, you were responsible for 16 keys of cocaine. Okay. Yeah. You lost 16 keys of cocaine and the people that sent you to get it and bring it back, you have to explain to them what happened to this now. And they're Colombian mm -hmm. and they're angry. Mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, well, basically I, I tried my, I like begged them. I'm like, listen, I'm like, you have to believe me. I'm like, I didn't do this. Like, I don't have any part in this. I'm like, he literally just, I mean, I thought you were meeting us over there. And yeah. like, I, I just was listening to him and I'm, I'm, stu I'm, I'm stupid, but like, I didn't do this, you know? And if it wasn't for the fact that we had became friends with the right hand man, I'm pretty sure they would have killed us because he was the one who was like, I believe them. Wow. That's crazy. Like he saved my fucking life by saying How that. old were you at this point? I was 23. 23? Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> they get mad. They're like, you're going to help us find him? And I was like, yeah, whatever you need, like, don't fucking kill me. <laughs> like, yeah. basically. And they leave. And they're like, we'll be in con like, we'll contact you, basically. And I was like, okay. And uh, about maybe like a week later, they call me and they're like, you need to find where he lives. I'm like, I don't know where he lives. And they're like, well, do you know somebody who knows where he lives? I'm like, maybe. And they're like, we'll give them 10 grand if they tell us where he lives. Wow. So just out of the sheer fact of saving my own fucking ass, I put out like that message basically. And uh, somebody like my friend who's affiliate, <laughs> we'll call him. Paul, <laughs> he, he's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. So he's like, but you have to come with me. And I was like, okay, fine. So that's intense. Yeah, I know. Now we're in a movie. I know. I'm fucking just, I felt now we're in a movie. I was trapped, man. Yeah. There is no getting out of nothing. Like it just gets worse. It just kept getting fucking worse. So anyways, uh, we, we go and pick up, not even the boss or the right hand man, some new motherfucks who I've never met before, who are very angry and mean and not as kind as like the, the Colombian. When I first met him, he was like a true Colombian where he like hug, kiss, yeah. like, Hey, like, this is my car. Do you want some Coke? Do you want to go eat? Are you hungry? What do you need? Like, mm. you know, and these guys were like, so where the fuck does this guy live basically, right? Well, maybe not so like that, but like they were angry and they- Did they use bad words? Kind of, they, okay. were, they were really fob. Fob? Yeah, they were what also- is fob, What does fob mean for those that don't know? Fresh off the boat. Fresh off the boat. Mm. So they're being aggressive. I think they're trying to intimidate us to like- Shake you down a bit. Yeah, to, uh, to be like, yeah, like we mean fucking business. Like there's gonna mm. be no fucking around. So they show us the money, basically. We pick them up in our car, weird. And uh, they're like, show us where he lives. So Paul takes us to the house and he's like, that's where he lives. Oh wow. Yeah. And so they're like peeking through his windows and I was like, but look, hey guys, like fucking settle down. Like this is a nice neighborhood. <laughs> like It was a nice neighborhood. So, um, they see that he's not there and they're like, we're not giving you the money. He's not here. And we're like, what? And so we were pissed. 
And basically, we just let them know where he lives and got and nothing, got out, nothing of out of it. And they got nothing out of it. Well, my friend was pissed. So now you got, you lost out on the 16 keys. You lost out on the $10,000. <laughs> like, you're, you're pretty shitty at, at criminality. Yeah. 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 It's too bad. Yeah. So what happened? Okay. So basically, uh, because they didn't give the money, Paul tipped off John and was like, they know where you live. Mm. Do not go home. And so that squashed that. And then basically they kind of just like left me alone after that. Cause I like, I, there was nothing else I could do. It's not like I showed them the house. I think they realized like I fucking knew nothing. Right. And thank God I knew nothing. Like, oh, was it stressful? It was stressful. I don't mm. like, I just, I just wanted to get in and get out. That's what I wanted. I think everybody does when they do crime. And, Quick uh, and simple. yeah, th- I just wanted to get in, get out. And then I was just trapped in this fucking like, oh. so, I mean, here I am still suffering from addictions in the fucking hole, uh, lost my opportunity of like change. And I was de- again, I was desperate. My back was up against the wall and maybe like, I'm like, I'm skimming by basically. And, uh, they call the Colombian calls me again, like maybe two months later. And he's like, I want you to find me somebody else. And I was like, I will do it. I was like, because I, well, one, I didn't want to put anybody else in danger. Like, I knew we were lucky to come back that time. And I was desperate. Like, I'm like, no, like, and I I just wanted to prove to them, too, like, that I'm not a piece of shit, that I didn't fuck them over. You're solid. Yeah. So there, he was like, no, at first. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll try and find somebody. So then I, another friend, I mean, what should we call him? You're going to run out of names. I know. Jack. Jack. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Jack just got jacked. He was dealing beans. Speed. Beans. Yeah. Beans? No, no, beans. What are beans? Fentanyl. Oh, shit. Yes. So he was dealing those. And um, that's the shitty thing about, you know, the opiates is like, I, th- I think that's where the most robberies and like B&Es come into play. But uh, he got robbed for about 40 grand. And so he was desperate as well. And I was like, look, this is what's up. I'm like, if you want to come, I'm like, or if you want to go do this, I'm like, it's there for you. I'm like, but I wasn't trying to like, I just knew he was fucked. And so was I. And so I'm trying to go and he wants me to find somebody else to go. So anyways, he's like, he eventually agrees. And, um, we end up uh, meeting up with him, and it was just—it was just different. It was a different vibe. Like obviously, that the, I guess the what's the word I'm looking for? The vibe. <sighs> Maybe the vibe. Yeah, it was. It was, it was definitely, tense. It was tense. It mm-hmm. wasn't the same. Um, but we were again. We were desperate, so it wasn't the same even when we got to Panama this time. So we fly to Panama. We're, we were picked up by different people. N- then none of them spoke English, mm-hmm. like not even a little bit. They drop us off at a fucking hotel, not even like a, a resort. And it's like a hotel in like the middle of the town, which was sweet because I did want to go explore. <laughs> and <laughs> so you're, you're finding, you're finding the good out of like the worst I, I, case scenario. I, I, do that. I tend to do that. Um, but a funny story from fucking being at the hotel. Oh my God. So we go get cocaine and, um, I thought I was having an allergic reaction. And so I make Jack, was it Jack? Yeah. Jack, go get me uh, Benadryl from a pharmacy. And I take two Benadryl. I'm like, it's not working. I'm still like, I'm just fucked. I don't know what the hell's going on with me. Maybe it was lace. I have no idea. So he goes and gets me like four more. I take four more and I take it with vodka. Oh, wow. And I fucking hallucinated for like two days. I, Benadryl? I don't know. I've never, been, I've never hallucinated enough Benadryl. Well, Mushrooms. Take, maybe we should do some Benadryl. Oh, I don't know. Take me, <laughs> I thought you were done this path, this road of crap. Leash it. I'm going to get you hooked on Benadryl. <laughs> Before you know it, I'm outside shopping <laughs> drug mud everywhere. You got any Benadryl? I'll settle for No Name's Life brand if it, if it clears up my shine. It's just, I mean, like, just a path of, of antihistamines. I don't know what the fuck's in Benadryl, but it makes you hallucinate if you take too much of oh, it. Wow. So, anyways... Aside from that, another side story, actually. You know we only have so much time for side stories. But this one's good. Okay. This one's good. Okay. So we want ecstasy, okay? Okay. We're trying to find ecstasy. And then I see some hookers. So I'm like, 
I'm like, Jack, go ask those hookers. I'm like, they for sure know where to get some fucking ecstasy. So he goes, he's like, ecstasy, ecstasy. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 you come, you come. And so he calls me over. So we come here. The girls are all like, hey, like trying to like fuck me, basically. And they're like, uh, they were saying, like, she spoke a little bit of English. She's like, we're going to we're going to take cab. And I'm like, okay. So we get in the cab, and then she's like, and then the cab's like, no, extra, he wanted an extra $10 because we were going to a part of the city where cabs don't go. Oh, wow. Like, because it's too fucking ghetto. Oof. We pay it. We start heading that way. As soon as we're about to, like, I mean, maybe about five minutes out of the downtown, they're like, hey, that's our pimp, basically. So they wave him over. He, get, he slams on his brakes. We jump out of the cab, and we get into the pimp's car. He spoke English. So then we're, they tell him what we want, and um, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to go get it. So we're driving, and it's like a fucking hour drive, okay? And like it's getting like tense. It's so dark out. Like We don't know where the fuck we are. We're not in the city at all. We're like in some weird like country like oh, wow. back road. Like It was, yeah, something wasn't right. And so Ben whispers to me. He's like... That was Jack. Oh, fuck! <laughs> Okay, fine, Ben, whatever. Ben? We don't we don't know his last name, it's real good. Anyway, so ben, ben whispers in my ear and he's like, when we stop, run. He's like, they don't want me, they want you. And I'm just like, like I'm fucking dying inside. Oh, and wow. I think, yeah. So, cause that's a real thing, especially in Panama. Like, human trafficking. Human trafficking is so fucking popular over there. Like, popular. I was in prison with a whole bunch of human traffickers. So, oh. yeah. So, anyways, we come to a stop, and the guy gets out of the car, and then some other guy comes out of his house, and then he comes back and he gets a ecstasy. So no human trafficking. No human trafficking. <laughs> so giant, giant, giant advocate of like against human trafficking. Maybe even human traffic. By the way, he gave us ecstasy, and we drove an hour back from the countryside. Back so it was a nice scenic route that didn't have enough street lamps to show us <laughs> off what was going on in Panama. Guy drives, uses all his gas money, his pimping time. Like this is where he could be making that big coin. <laughs> Those girls weren't working, and they wanted to make sure you guys had ecstasy. Yeah. Uh, judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So anyways, moving on, we get the bags of our Coke. It's from different people. The bags look shittier. Uh, they dropped us off at the airport two hours, no, four hours early, sorry. So we're sitting. Ducks. Like sitting fucking ducks. It mm. was fucking awful. We had no money left. I remember, uh, mm. I remember Ben bought a fucking hot dog with our last like three dollars. Oh Jesus! He was like, "Do you want some?" I couldn't eat. I was just too like strung out. I was strung out. I was fucking. I just wanted to get back, and I, I just had bad feelings. Like I really did. And uh, I remember, I had my laptop, and I was messaging my mom, and I was like, "Hey, I'm getting on the plane now," and she was like, "Okay, good luck." And I was like, "Good luck? Why would?" Why would you say that? Like, what do you, what do you, what are you saying? What do you know? Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what? Why would you say that? And it just like it flared like this like gut feeling. I'm like fucking something bad is gonna happen. But I kept ignoring, kept pushing it down. Like I just need to get back to Canada. It's gonna be all good. This is July 1st, 2012. All of a sudden, they bring up these bags, and Ben's like, "Those are our bags," and I was like. No, they're not. He's like, yeah, they are. And I'm like, oh my god, like, those are our fucking bags. And then all, and there was some guy going around asking to look at our passports. And we realize now it was to find out who was attached to the bags. Oh boy. Because when we get in line to go board the plane, as soon as it comes to us, they're like, come this way. And we're like, okay. Mm. And so then they're like, are these your bags? And we're like, yeah, these are our bags. And they're like, did you pack them yourself? And we're like, yeah. And they're like, mm. okay. So and it, sorry, it was only one bag. Ben had his own suitcase. It was like this little piece of shit, like leather bag. And then I had like the big bag. And I think we had four keys. Yeah, we had four keys in there. So <clears throat> the cop takes out, or like, I don't know, whatever police dude, takes out this fucking huge knife and he just cuts into the into the bag and like Coke started pouring out. And Ben was just like, he was like, literally his face was so white. And I just, I was just numb. Like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't, I was just like, 
Nothing. So like the movies, he just took this knife out of his pocket, rammed it into the suitcase, mm -hmm. tears it open, and Coke just starts to fall out of this yeah. thing. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. And the bag was in your guy's name. Yeah. And so um, it was a Sunday that we got arrested. And I don't know if you know about the Spanish countries, but they're super, super religious. So everything's closed on Sundays, including like cop shops. They left you at the airport. So we had to be, we, I was handcuffed to a fucking table um, on a floor. They gave me a piece of cardboard to sleep on. And it was freezing because of the air conditioning blasting. And uh, I could slip my cuffs. So like I was secretly like slipping my cuffs so that they could just like curl up and try and stay warm. And then when they would like, when I hear them coming, I would just put it back on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had, we had to stay there for one night and um, they let us sit together, handcuffed together in the morning and they fed us breakfast. And uh, he was like, and, like me and Ben were talking and I was like, I'm just gonna kill myself. And he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna kill myself too. He's like, I don't wanna do this. I'm like, yeah, I can't fucking do this. Like I was thinking the worst. I was like, okay, like cold, dark dungeon, getting fucking poked with sticks, not being fed, being raped, being beat. Like, I don't, I don't know. How the fuck am I supposed to know what prison's yeah. like in Panama? It's a third world fucking country, you know? I watch Broken Down Palace. Yeah. Remember that movie? Yeah. I'm thinking that, you know? I'm thinking like, oh, I'm just, I, I honestly, and I think that deciding to kill myself is what helped me get through that. It was like, maybe like a, a, a safety like mechanism, like for the mind and body, I don't know. But um, I, I was at peace with that. I was like, yeah, I'm just, fuck it. Yeah, I, like, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. Um, and he was at the same place, so I don't know. It was, uh, it was a fucked up time. I can't even, I'm kind of like at a loss for words right now, like being in that feeling again. So when you share this part of the story, yeah. it takes you right back. Yeah. Like if it was yesterday. And this yeah. is 2012, yeah. July. Yeah. So it's almost within the month of when it happened. I, I'm coming up on the ninth year right now. And you're still dealing with all the ramifications of it. I mean, I, I probably haven't really gone through it enough to really actually deal with it. I know it's one of those things that I have to do, like in therapy and whatnot, but it, it, I, don't, I don't like to like try and pick at things. I get, take it as it comes. And mm. so it kind of is coming right now, so sorry. <laughs> but... Um, are you upset? I am a little bit. I feel sad. Like, I feel like tears behind my eyes. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having tears behind your eyes. You went through, that was a pretty harrowing experience you went yeah. through. Yeah. I mean, after everything, like, it was just such a fucking, like, what a kick to the nuts. Already, like, already the life you've lived, poverty, the struggles being a kid, going into teenage years, drug addiction, mm -hmm. finding people to align yourself with that weren't the best of people, took you down a path had a chance to make money, we're making money, the Petroleum Club, mm -hmm. and somehow your addictions got the best of you, mm -hmm. and your addictions led you to this place, this moment where you're handcuffed to a table in Panama, yeah. and your life just flashed before your eyes, mm -hmm. and your only solution, you and the friend you're with, were you're gonna kill yourself. Yeah. There's no way you were gonna deal with what was going on. Yeah. It was too real. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, and... And what comes with thinking about killing yourself, you think about the people that you're leaving behind. And um, I felt bad for Ben too, because I felt like I, I put him in this situation. And so when we were handcuffed together that morning, um, I had like this idea where I was like, you know what? I'm like, I'm just gonna say that it was only me. I'm like, you go home and you tell my family what happened. And like just tell them everything because I didn't want them to look for me you know like I didn't know if if they were gonna even know what happened to me like I had no like if I go to jail are they gonna know that I went to jail if I die there are they gonna know that I died there like how do I, I don't I didn't know and so I just I really wanted him to go home and like not die or go to jail and also so that my family could at least have some closure as to what happened <laughs> it makes me sad <sighs> After they let Ben go, because we officially, you know, do our declaration, I guess is what they call it over there, I get uh, sent to like a little holding cell where there's fucking 13 of us in like a, 
maybe like a seven by seven foot room. It's fucking- So you took the heat for Ben? Yeah. No way. Yeah. I didn't know that. So Ben could have been equally charged as you were. Yep. But instead you took the entire burden upon you. You took the, you took the whole blame. Yeah. And Ben got let go. I mean, I, wow. I wanted to save his life and I wanted my family to know what happened. Cause I was like, well, I'm just like, I'm going to kill myself anyway. So fuck it. Like, let's like, maybe I can do something good before I die. <laughs> like who would do that in this day and age? Who would, who would, who would take the rap for something like that and to let a friend go? That's amazing. Yeah. That was a really good deed considering the circumstances. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, so <laughs> hmm. I end up in these holding cells and there's actually like two other Canadian girls in there. They're from Quebec. I still talk to them now. Um, but there was like 14 of us in this like fucking tiny ass jail cell and we were in there like sardines and we had to like huddle up while we were sleeping. Like we literally like in a row with one, like it wasn't even a blanket, it was a tarp that we had to use for our blanket. We were in there for about five days. And then after they finally, like, when we get, like, fingerprinted and they realize, like, we're officially getting charged, you get sent to the prison. And so I'm, like, we drive up to the prison and all I can hear is this loud bass and music. And I was, like, I'm, like, thinking, I'm, like, what am I going to? Like, I'm, like, maybe it's just, like, a big open field and they just play music all day or something. <laughs> A little bit of Shambhala, I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, so it turns out that that was just the club across the street. Oh. <laughs> I get in there and I literally thought I was gonna, like, I thought my heart was just gonna stop. Like, I thought I was just gonna keel over and die because it was so fucking overwhelming. Like, I couldn't breathe. Like, it was so hot, it was so crowded. There was fucking women everywhere. And when, and so it's, it, <laughs> I'm guilty of doing this too, but when new people come in, they know when new people are coming in, right? You get told by the guards. And so they know when it's lockup time, that's when they're bringing in the new people. And so everybody is fucking banging on like the great windows and they're saying, carne fresca. And they're just <laughs> oh God, making like kiss faces at you, telling you they're gonna eat you or that you're gonna be their bitch, like whatever. And I couldn't understand what they're saying at the time, but like, I was just like, holy fuck. Like, and it's loud. There's a thousand women there. Could you imagine a thousand, maybe not a thousand of them are actually doing this. There you go. But. A thousand women. But like, there's a thousand women there, but like uh, half of them are, are doing this hazing. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. So it's fucking intimidating as hell. I was like, great. I'm like, this is like, fuck, <laughs> you know? So I walk into my house. There's 10 houses. There's a hundred girls in each of them. Okay, I'm in house one. House one and house five are the, the foreigners. So they bring me to this girl named Laylee. I'll use her real name. And she speaks English, Spanish, Italian, Patois. And I, I think that might be it. But they bring me to her because she speaks English and Spanish, so she can translate for mm. the both of us. And the first thing she says to me is like, so you're Canadian, eh? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, how long have you been here? And she's like, um, two years. And I was like, hmm. what? Fuck. Two years? She's like, yeah. I'm like, Oh my god! And then, like ten minutes later, like I was like I, I was like seriously like I asked her probably like three times how how long she'd been there for, and she's like I told you two years, and I'm like I just couldn't like couldn't get couldn't the register. I couldn't. It just wouldn't go in. I was like I can't be here for two years. I can't like oh my god like yeah. you know I had no idea how long I was gonna be there because in Panama you don't get your sentence before you go to jail. You go to jail and then you wait for your- They court. decide. They decide, like, well, you go to court, you get a court date, but it takes so long. Like, they're not, it's a mm. third world fucking country. Yeah. They don't even use computers that much in, that, in the system. Like, everything is paper. It was fucked up when we would have riots. The fucking Panamanians would set everything on fire, thinking that they're like, anarchy, like, whatever. But really, you're just fucking yourselves over and everybody else because you're burning our papers that tell us who's here how oh, long wow. we've been here for. You know what I mean? There's people that have literally been forgotten in there. It's fucked. So there's people in the Panama jail right now that have 
Yeah. Or like what will happen is, is they'll, um, instead of like, like they'll burn like their court, um, papers or whatever. So they won't know how many years they actually got. And so what they'll do is they'll release you what, whatever the max sentence was. How many riots were there in this prison? <sighs> Too many to count. Too many to count. But my first one, I was like so excited. I could, I was like, I want to be in the riot. I want to know what's, like, what, go, like, what happens? Like, it's fucked up. <laughs> People are going, okay, first of all, the guards, like, they're like, you're either getting in or you're getting out. If you're, and once you're out, you're out. Once you're in, you're in. They lock the fucking doors and they run because their lives are in danger, right? Oh. And so they, they give you that quick moment. And so a lot of people don't either hear it because there's so many fucking people in a house. And so what they'll do is they'll take something hard or whatever we have and they'll bust down a fucking wall through our, like, cause it's just like a concrete house and like one part of the, our patio where you like, you did your dishes and stuff, it was just brick. So they would just fucking break through it and then we would all crawl out of the hole and I had to crawl out of a hole to get out because I wanted to get out and I wanted to see what was gonna go on. There's fucking people robbing people, punching people, setting things on fire, screaming around, trying to break it into the office. Like it's literally, it's it's like a movie. It is mayhem. Wow. It is fucking mayhem. It's insane. And The then, only time you smiled in the last 20 minutes <laughs> is, is talking about this riot. He's just like, they bust a hole where we wash our dishes and there I crawled for freedom. And he really just wanted to see some shit go down. <laughs> and there was people beating the shit and robbing out of each other. I finally found peace at this place. Uh, wow. I was excited. And you weren't even like sentenced yet. I and you're already in a riot. It's different there, okay? Like, I don't know how, I don't know what else to say. Anyway. So time went by. <laughs> time went by. 10 months goes by before I get to go to my court hearing. 10 months. 10 months. Is that uh, dead time? That's, no, it's, oh, it's all counts. So okay. everything counts served from July 1st. Mm. Um, but that was actually fast. Some people wait like two years to see a fucking judge. The oh. only reason why I went by so fast is because when I made my declaration, mm -hmm. I said, yes, the drugs are all mine. Ben had nothing to do with it. I'm guilty. Mm. That's the why, that's why it took, it didn't take so long because so many people are like, oh, I want a lawyer before I write a declaration. Mm -hmm. And then when they write their declaration, it's like conflicting with whoever or what, you know, blah, 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 like this and that. But mine was just so like, boom. So they're like, I got my court date right away. So 10 months is actually fast. Yeah. I went to court and I had a translator there with me and I had to pay eight grand for my fucking lawyer. And Where did eight grand come from? Friends? Friends. <laughs> That's good though. Friends that I actually still talk to, I guess you could say. And uh, I mean, we're not cool. close, but you know, I appreciate those friends for sure, 100%. Mm -hmm. I will always. Uh, Their help helped you. They fuck. Yeah, they, they fucking helped. Big time, me. eh? Yeah. So, anyways, um, my translator was a piece of shit. She could care less about being there. She was on her fucking phone the whole time. And I'm like, I barely speak English at this, or I mean English, I barely speak Spanish. Like I do speak Spanish, but like not like, brr, brr, like not like that. You know, I can say what I want, can say what I need. I can understand what mm -hmm. you're like asking of me. But like when somebody is just like talking, 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 I had no idea what the fuck she was saying. My translator is just had no, nothing for me. And I'm like, for fuck's sakes, man. And then finally she's like, oh, she wants to know uh, like, what you want to say and I was like and so I'm like all like fucking choked up and I'm like suit like my life's on the line here basically and I'm like uh I'm I'm sorry and I said it so quiet like that and she was like what and I'm like never mind like I just like I couldn't I didn't know like I just froze you know and so the judge so that was actually bad for me the judge gave me the max which was 11 years 11 Years minus one sixth for confession, and then she said that because I wasn't giving up names and because I didn't show remorse, that's why I got the max. But because I said that it was mine, they're gonna take off one sixth. So I ended up getting nine years, one month, and 27 days. My fucking heart fell through my ass, <laughs> like I didn't know what to do. 
And my only support there, other than my fucking shitty ass lawyer and <laughs> translator, was the embassy, the Canadian embassy, and this lady named Deborah. And uh, I cried. I was like fucking bawling. I didn't know what to do. And she was like, don't worry. She's like, whatever your sentence is, she's like, it doesn't matter. Like, you're still going to go back to Canada. She's like, it doesn't, it, whether you get 20 years or 10 years, she's like, this process is still the same. You're going to go back to your own country. And so I was like, okay, because I was thinking maybe I need to fucking appeal it. Do I need another eight grand to appeal this shit? Yeah. Like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I, like... But when she told me that, I was like, thank God, like, okay, I'll like, let's just proceed with however I fucking get yeah. back to Canada. And so they, on average, it's supposed to take two years. It took four and a half motherfucking years for me to get back to Canada. I don't like, I, I, I call it divine intervention. It was really shitty at the time. But I honestly think that if I had made it back sooner, that I probably would have went back to opiates. Like, I was off that shit for so long. Four and a half years is a long time. There was no opiates. There was a lot of fucking cocaine, and I did a lot of that. <laughs> but it, it honestly, I think it saved my life being away for that long. And it was really hard, and there was definitely some highs and lows to it. But it, it initially, like, it saved my life. I don't think I'd be, if I made it back that second time, yeah. I think I'd be dead. And if I didn't go at all, I think I'd be dead. So it's like, it's really humbling to <laughs> say that prison saved my life. Because it, it did. And like, I honestly, like, I found myself there. I finally, I finally had like those clouds, like those rain clouds, like lift from me, even though I was in like, once I obviously got used to yeah. the culture shock and learning the language and like living this new fucking way of third world living like <laughs> that was it was intense like fucking no water sometimes no electricity sometimes you have to buy toilet paper you ain't got money you're wiping your ass with your hand like what <laughs> just like all these little things like but it it honestly like it it gave me so much to be like slapped in the fucking face with that reality. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was an intense experience, but it changed me forever for the, for the better. What would you say, if you were to look back in those four and a half years, what would you say was the, what would you say was the most um, memorable moment in those four and a half years? If there's just one, if there's just one moment in that time, I mean, what was the most memorable, like something that touched you, something that maybe affected you and changed your life? Aside from the, the situation which changed your life, what about being in that prison? One moment would you say was defining or memorable? Ah, uh, you want me to pick one? <laughs> we only have time for one. <laughs> um, I guess it would probably be... The first time that I prayed was there. Wow. And it was actually when I was about to declare, I, I prayed for the first time in my entire fucking life. Whoa. And I was like, God, like, I'm like, please. I'm like, just like, tell me what to do. Like, what do I do? Like, am I gonna like, what, how do I do this? And I was crying and like, I was actually like saying it like out loud. Like I, I never prayed like that before ever. I've never prayed. And all of a sudden I just felt like this tingling like on my shoulders and I felt this like weight lifted and I felt calm and I felt at peace. And it's so funny because when I was in that holding cell, the girls kept saying, they're like, you're so happy, like what? Are you like, are you sad? And like, I was sad, but like, yeah. I felt I had this weird feeling that everything was gonna be okay. Like, from that prayer or? From that prayer. Mm. From that one that it was like, that it was fucked. I don't know how to explain it. It's no, like, it's okay. We, in our first episode, our very first episode, episode was, um, we covered what was happening in Palestine and Israel, yeah. and we had the leader of the Palestinian protests here in Calgary, okay. and her name is Maha Agul, and she's a Muslim woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we talked about prayer in general, mm -hmm. and we talked about humanity, 
and what it takes to be a good human mm -hmm. and is to have a little faith. Mm -hmm. It comes down to a little faith mm -hmm. because ultimately, like, how can we possibly carry the burdens we put ourselves into and still be able to have a positive reflection on what's going no on? Way. There is no way. And be it God, be it Allah, or be it the universe or whatever it is you pray to, mm -hmm. faith is faith. Yeah. And sometimes the divine and the ether and whatever it is that you're praying to, mm -hmm. there are spiritual beings, there are the God yeah. that hears, hears our cries, hears our prayer. Yeah. And when you talk about that alleviation um, of the stress and the burden, and you had that moment of peace, mm -hmm. and then it was noticeable mm -hmm. from the other inmates that were like, how can you be so positive mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. And you saying it was prayer. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And the first time I ever prayed. Have you prayed since? I pray every fucking day. That's what's up. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, how did National cool. Geographic find you? They saw my, so, okay. Our, my transfer was taking so fucking long. Like it shouldn't have taken that long. And I was there with this girl named Natalia. And she um, had a friend who worked for Global. And so her friend had told her cousin or whoever she was to her about us and she wanted to do the story with us. Mm -hmm. So we do a story with Global. It was like a two day spread, blah, 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 blah. That's how National Geographic found me. No way. They found me on Instagram and um, we started corresponding like through Instagram. And then eventually we did some video chats and I don't, it took me a while to actually agree to do that because I don't know. It's hard yeah. to bear your truth, right? I wasn't sure. Like, I knew I always wanted to use that experience for, like, the greater good or, like, just do something good with it, like, anything, right? If I, even if I just talk about it with, like, random people and, you know, it helps them help somebody else, like, that's awesome, you know? So I ended up doing, I ended up agreeing to do it, and, uh, yeah. What's it called? It's called uh, Locked Up Abroad. Locked Up Abroad. I'm actually in a sub- category where it's called banged up abroad banged it's, up. it's still locked up abroad but it's called banged up abroad because they talk about like the one of the highlights in my episode is about how i actually got these teeth marks in me from panama wow you gotta tell me that one after the after the after the show <laughs> okay we'll go for yeah. a snack i want to hear about how you got teeth marks all right well that was that was a very interesting episode. That was uh, an episode that I'm going to remember for a long time. Yeah. And I'm glad we had a chance. This is our visit, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This was our visit, and I wanted to hear the story. And I want to have, there's actually a lot more I want to know as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's people online right now and that are going to be following this episode that are going to be following you. Mm -hmm. What's your Instagram in case they want to ask questions? It's Christina Jocko. Christina Jocko? <laughs> yeah, it's my name. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> I'm, I mean, you should know that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, they hit you up. Yeah. They can, they can follow your story a bit. Yeah, I, I actually, I have people that reach out all the time and I, I do my best. Uh, like, I mean, I ignore the creepy motherfuckers. Yeah. But people who are like genuinely, like I have a lot of people that actually talk to me about addiction all the time. They're like, what do I do? Like, I need help. And you know, I never want to be a person to be like, fuck yourself or like, don't, I'm just ignore, you know? Yeah. Like I will always like respond maybe not right away because sometimes I do get overwhelmed of by course. that too but I, I do um, take pride in responding I do respond especially when people like even if you just want to say like hey like I saw you and that's what I did awesome that's what I did yeah and here we are yeah here we are years later yeah I'm friendly yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a bully anymore you're also hilarious <laughs> you got a great sense of humor mm -hmm. and you're very brave and you're very courageous and we really appreciate you coming on the show I'm glad that, I am appreciate that. I'm honored that you came and shared your story. Well, thank you for asking me. It has been a lovely time. Mm. Well, there you guys have it. For Whom the Bell Tolls, Christina Jocko. This was a uh, very cool episode. So if you guys want to hear more about her story, hit her up, ask her, unless LK is the time, which he probably doesn't because he's <laughs> the most busiest filmmaker I know in Calgary. But if we do get a chance, maybe we'll get a couple episodes in. So thank you all for tuning in. Really appreciate you coming through. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. All right. That's it.